it's time to actually begin. We'll start, of course, chapter Again, one. I might Chapter suggest one, you're as you go find through each slide of psychology that you and its major take approaches. notes on the narration when it's needed, and also and the we bet we're off when they appear, since these questions will appear on quizzes and tests. If we were able to meet in a traditional manner, I would begin my course by giving you a 13-question quiz on psychology, just to see what you know at this point. And when I'm done, I'd have you switch your their neighbors to keep everybody honest. So I'd ask you to take this little quiz right now and record the answers perhaps in your notebook. And then we'll see what we know to start and it'll show us some of the directions we'll be heading in the course. So again, please actually take it. Are you ready to see how you did? Let's start with the most basic question, the father of psychology. Did you put Sigmund Freud, Ivan Pavlov, B.F. Skinner, or Wilhelm Wundt. It was actually Wilhelm Wundt. You might never have heard of his name before, and that's perfectly fine, but still, he is the father of psychology. Right now, let's look at the general time period psychology was founded. Later on, you'll have to learn the exact date, but that's later. Which do you choose? Psychology is a fairly young science, began in the 1800s, and as I mentioned soon, we'll learn the exact date, 1879. Next, animals and psychology experiments. A little, a lot, that's the question. Normally I'd have people raise their hands for the quiz that they're grading, and I'd start with less than one or 10, and maybe one or two people per class would raise their hands, and one of those two people might get it right. The correct answer is 10%, and that's with a little bit of rounding, some years it's seven, some years it's six and a half, and so on almost 10%. So if you're putting 60 to 70 or more than 75, who are you off? Next, let's look at the insanity defense as used in criminal courts cases. And I often ask here if anybody's a criminal justice uh, program person, because those teachers will give you the same number that I will give you. I'll ask the same question as the previous question. I ask people to raise their hands if the quiz they're grading had less than one or 10% circled. It would in fact be considerably less than 1%. So I tell people, uh, jokingly, that they got this question wrong. They're probably watching too many TV sitcom dramas. And if you're watching too much TV, I will help you with this problem. For number five, we have much better odds, 50-50. True, false, Alzheimer's is a treatable condition. Indeed, that is true. If you're feeling surprised, why? It is treatable. Many students say, well, it's not curable. Well, treatable means it can be treated. It's very different from the word curable. For example, if I asked you, is diabetes curable? People will say no. Treatable, yes, and so on. So it is a treatable condition. I can remember where I taught when the first medication came out. That was back when I was at Watertown at Jefferson Community College quite a long time ago. Let's consider number six, the term psychotic or psychosis, if used correctly. The key to that is out of touch with reality. If you select a dangerous, it has nothing to do with dangerous. Actually, a sad fact for women, you're most likely to be either injured intentionally or killed, not by a psychotic person, but by who? And I ask the cast for guesses, and they'll guess boyfriend or husband, or ex-boyfriend or ex-husband, and sadly, that is true. So again, psychotic simply means a person that's out of touch with reality. It means more than having trouble functioning. Specifically, it means out of touch. Next, the one biological question. And I think I'll take a pause here to stop and restart my uh, narration. So later in the course, we'll spend a whole chapter, chapter three, looking at the biology of psychology. So I thought that one brain-based question might be appropriate. And this I thought would be the most basic one. So the outer wrinkled surface, it'd be the last choice, your cerebral cortex. Next is consider smoking. Perhaps you're a smoker, or perhaps you have a smoker in your life that you're trying to move into the non-smoker category. But in case, how many years on average do you think it shortens a typical lifespan? Current research suggests 10 years. So if you're a smoker, you're going to have to decide if it's worth 10 years of your life. And if you're a non-smoker with a smoker or loved one, well, here's a little bit more ammunition for you. Next, let's consider two mental health conditions, schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. 
two names for the same thing, different but related, or two unrelated conditions, it would be the last choice, two totally unrelated conditions with different causes, different symptoms, and different treatments is basically as different as you can get. If you got it wrong, probably again watching too much TV, I can remember a particular MASH episode that misused these terms. So again, if the problem is too much time on your hands watching TV, I will help you with that. Number 10, virtually no scientists accept any of Sigmund Freud. Well, we'll probably collectively make a little fun of Freud's, some of Freud's idea, but many of Freud's ideas are so basic and so accepted that you might be very surprised that they'll learn they're Freudian. So scientists do believe in certain aspects of Freud's uh, concepts and theories. 11, another true false, shock treatment, specifically electroconvulsive therapy, is still used in the US, and it would be true. At this point, I usually ask my students for what condition would be most likely to be used. Many students say uh, epilepsy, uh, no, uh, sorry, not, not close. It's most likely to be cons uh, used for mood disorders, such as major depression and bipolar disorder, though it is a very rare treatment. Medications typically work very, very effectively, so this is one of our fallback positions. Seldom needed, but occasionally yes. Let's consider 12, our next true faults. Memory is typically more accurate under hypnosis. Let me ask it this way. I'd ask my students to raise their hands if they uh, care about their grades in college. And I suggest if you can't raise your hands, this is the wrong place for you right now anyway. Then I ask, are you willing to do the basic things you could to succeed? Again, virtually everybody raises their hands. And then I ask, how many people have secured their hypnosis for the semester? And I say, why not? You say that you want to succeed. You're willing to do what you think it takes. So if you think hypnosis would help, well, then you should probably have secured it. But I'm glad you didn't because hypnosis will not enhance your memory. In fact, it will introduce more inaccuracies into your memory. But we'll look at that more in the consciousness chapter quite a bit down the road. 13 is my favorite because it's fill in the blank. Blank is the most commonly used psychoactive drug, and since that's a technical term, I explain it. It's a drug that can enter the brain and influence it. I get all sorts of uh, possibilities. LSD, crack, meth. Uh, no, uh, I'm not going to have any of those today. I hope you aren't either. Uh, that gets students thinking. Alcohol, in the ballpark, but no. Caffeine. So caffeine is a psychoactive drug. It can enter the brain and impact our functioning. I ask if people can get addicted to it, and everybody agrees, and I ask for some of the common symptoms, such as irritability, trouble sleeping, and so on. So caffeine is a psychoactive drug. If you need a little help in the spelling, that's fine. C-A-F-F-E-I-N-E. -E. So go ahead and total the number that you've got correct, and please record it somewhere that you can access it later in the course, maybe on the inside cover of your notebook, perhaps. I'll tell you to look at that point later on the course when you'll need it. So if you didn't do well, uh, that's okay. In most classes, I'll get zero to two people that pass it. So why do I bother to do this? Well, first of all, to see what you know, but to also show you what sort of information we'll be learning in the course. So if you did poorly, that's actually good. It's showing me that you don't know everything there is to know about psychology, and therefore you're showing me great potential to learn. And isn't it great to start a course showing superb potential to learn? And you do have superb p potential, and I am totally serious. I'd like to introduce you to a very useful symbol. It's a symbol shown in black uh, in the middle of the page and also by the heart. That symbol is called the psi. It's a letter of the Greek alphabet, but importantly for us, the psi has been adopted to be the symbol of psychology. Some textbooks on psychology portray it very prominently on the cover. It's much quicker to write that single letter than it is the word psychology, or even P-S-Y-C-H is still five letters. So I would strongly suggest you practice it a few times and use it. It's very effective and I think you'll come to like it. So this is our psi. In our second class meeting, I asked my students to take a look at the sheet on the next page and to try to spell all the words. Uh, they are all their spellments correctly. The reason I'm doing this is that I think it's a reasonable expectation in college that the 
fundamental essential concepts you should be able to spell correctly. In our course, I've limited to 10 words and 10 related words. Uh, I did this one year. I was grading final exams. In a couple classes, I had people that were still had students that were misspelling the word psychology. I thought, well, that's unfortunate, not only for the student, but that's also unfortunate for me as a teacher to have let it got that far. So for these 10 words, you will need to have an exact spelling. For the rest of the words of our course, as long as it sounds exactly like it should, you'll be given full credit. Uh, exception for this will be on fill in the blank on the blackboard to be recognized. Blackboard is fussy, so those you will have to be careful with and spell correctly. But for the rest of our words uh, in other contexts, such as hand and work, a misspelling, as long as they're not in these fundamental 10 words, is acceptable. Please go ahead and test yourself on these 10 words. The correct spellings will be on our next slide. So let's see how you did. Psychology, any word that has psych, uh, psychology, psychologist, psychometric, psychiatrist. If you hear the psych, it would be P-S-Y-C-H. Uh, students often accidentally forget the H. It needs the H. Next one, our father of psychology, one Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, remember that the Germans pronounce their uh, W's with V's. So if you know the musician Wagner, they don't call him Wagner, they call him Wagner. So Wilhelm Wundt. Next uh, variation of psychology, psychologist. Don't forget the H. Uh, next, conscious. Number five, unconscious. And six, conscience. And yes, they do sound a little bit like, but they're very distinctly different. We'll have a whole chapter on states of consciousness. So let's consider number four, conscious. We are alert, we're conscious, we're processing information. Uh, unconscious, not alert, not processing. Conscience, number six, a sense of morality. So conscious, unconscious, and conscience. Seven, Pavlov, eight, Maslow, sometimes Students tend to mix and match the letters. Nothing good comes of that. Next, schizophrenia. Don't ever shorten it to schizo. That's very rude. It's very impolite. Uh, don't go there. And it's not even desirable to say a schizophrenic. It's a person with schizophrenia. They're more than their condition. Number 10, our Sigmund Freud, who apparently is not the father of psychology. Let's now consider the definition of psychology. I ask my students sometimes to jot down what they think a word or phrase would be that would best describe what psychology is. Some students tell me mind, and that's not a bad answer. Uh, that's where psychology did begin, but it's no longer the current focus, so we need a broader definition. And the best definition, and you'll see it also in your textbook, is behavior. So we will define psychology as a scientific study of behavior. Definitely a very good definition to commit to memory. So let's consider what category of science psychology is in. When I ask, when I ask my course, sometimes I get natural as an answer. Uh, no, uh, natural sciences would include things as biology, uh, chemistry, and physics, and so on. It would be in the category of social science. If you're thinking behavioral science, that's also a correct answer, but I prefer social science, so I'll ask you to use the phrase social science when you think of it in our course. Can you name some of the social sciences offered by SCCC or other community colleges? Take a moment and we'll see how you do on the next slide. Other social sciences at SCCC would be sociology, political science, economics, anthropology, and history. Though history is a little bit of an odd duck, depending on the research methods used and the questions asked, it can either be considered a social science or a humanities. So remember, we're focusing on the definition 
what is psychology, and we noted it was a scientific study of behavior. So we've mentioned uh, type of science, uh, social science that is, and next we should consider, since behavior is the essential component of our definition, we could, should consider the basic types of behavior. As you can see in the slide, behaviors can be classified as being either overt or covert. Overt, let's define that as actions, which can be directly observed or measured. After you get that into your notes, please consider how we might define covert behaviors, seeing if you can maybe even guess our definition word for word. So for covert behaviors, our definition will be actions which cannot, make the not big and bold, actions which cannot be directly observed or measured. And you might find this puzzling. It's an action, but you can't observe it. Well, let me help you. Think of the mental processes. In psychology, mental processes are considered to be a type of behavior, just a type of covert behavior. So it might help us to clarify the concept of covert behaviors if we could put a few examples now into our notes. So consider what might be examples of covert behaviors uh, might be going on in your mind right now, or if you're sitting in a room with other people, what may be some of the behaviors going on in their minds. So take a moment and list a few possible examples. So there are many, many examples. Problem solving, critical thinking, Accessing memories, learning, to name just a very, very few. Let's do a little concept check. For each of these, take a moment before I give the answer and decide if you think it's an overt or covert behavior. Note taking. Well, definitely observable, so that would be an overt behavior. In a typical classroom situation, uh, if everybody around you is taking notes and you are not, unless you have a note taker, that's a problem. I rarely have students pass the course who don't take notes. Even on this sort of uh, medium, virtual, you still need to take notes. Listening. You might want to say that that is an overt behavior, but no, that is covert. In a typical lecture, I cannot tell if students are listening. A student could be, for example, deaf and lip reading. The last example, texting. Well, if a student is engaging in texting under the desk, clearly they think they're engaged in a covert behavior, and it might well remain covert for a little while, but promise sooner or later, I will notice it, and I will also often sneak up to them and be lecturing about it, and they're oblivious to that fact. And I'll ask them what they're doing under the desk. Uh, I teach human sexuality, so my mind does tend to go in various directions here. And I tell them that whatever they're doing under the desk, it is simply not allowed in the situation. So although the student might want to say covert, your teacher and classmates will definitely strongly say overt. Let's now turn our attention to the four goals of psychology. The first one, Describe or description is perfectly fine. I think it's a simple concept, and yet years of teaching have told me and instructed me that it is not the case. So look at the picture there and write a brief description into your notes. If this was a non virtual class, that is face to face, I would make that particular uh, gesture in front of you and ask you to give me, again, a good description. So please describe what you see in that box. And you'll find that. You may have a very good answer, or you may not even be in the remote ballpark. We'll have to see. So generally, my answers fall in one of two categories, uh, the correct and the not correct. Let's start with this example. Thumbs up. Other students might say, good job. Another student might say, uh, left arm held out, fingers curled in, thumb pointing upwards. Well, clearly the thumbs up and good job is a very different sort of answer than the one with the fingers being curled and the thumb pointed upwards. The first two are not descriptions at all. They are interpretations. The last example with the thumbs cur uh, fingers curled and thumbs up, 
that is a description. For example, if we went to every culture in the planet and were able to speak every language, the description would be the same. But the interpretation, which has nothing to do with the description, the interpretation, which some of the students tried to give me, would vary from culture to culture. So this could mean good job. That's one interpretation. It could mean thumbs up. If you're looking at somebody standing for a, beside a vehicle with smoke coming out of it and they're doing this gesture, it probably means that they need a ride. Uh, should you do this particular hand gesture in the Middle East? Uh, definitely not. It's very similar to one of our hand gestures, uh, one that you would not do in a classroom setting or even plate settings. I am told, based on a sheet, that if you do this in a German bar versus a Japanese bar, it will either get you one or five beers. I do not frequent either German or Japanese bars, so that'll be that. Consider a different example, if you find this fun. Let's say that I shake my head left to right. Description would be head being moved left to right, but what would the interpretation be? Well, in our culture, it means no, but in various cultures in the world, head going left to right means yes. So let's say that you're in a particular country and a person comes up to you and asks you, would you like to buy the services of a prostitute? You're shocked and vigorously shake your head left to right, meaning yes, and now you are now, unfortunately, haggling over a prostitution uh, purchase. Probably not your intention. So again, description is the same. The interpretation, the uh, explanation, Ah, that's a different step altogether. So the first goal of psychology we learned was to describe or maybe description. For number two, I mentioned interpretation, and that's certainly an acceptable choice for number two. Though on the slide, I prefer the term explanation, but either one would work very nicely on a test. So first we describe the phenomena, then with much research, we hope to explain the phenomena. Later on down the road, maybe prediction of the phenomena, and the last one, to control the phenomena. Now certainly for the fourth one in particular, there are many good synonyms that I would accept, but to make life easy, let's go with describe, explain, predict, and control. Let me give you an example. In the early days of psychology, the first psychologist to study schizophrenia, Eugene Blauer, gave us a very good description that would match very well modern day descriptions of psychology, schizophrenia. Delusions, hallucinations, odd movement, odd emotions, and so on, odd thinking. But he would not be able to explain the cause of schizophrenia in his lifetime. Nowadays we can, we talk in terms of neurotransmitter issues, particularly with dopamine. Prediction, well can we predict with some degree of accuracy who will develop schizophrenia? Somewhat. We know if you have a first degree relative, mother, father, brother, sister, you have a greatly increased odds, but it's more than simple genetics. Even if your identical twin develops schizophrenia, you do not necessarily develop that condition. The last goal, to control schizophrenia, uh, modify it, uh, help the person with it, change the course of it, that would be our fourth goal. So again, describe, explain, predict, and control. I would caution you on a test. Many times for number one, I get the word DEF. I, -N -E, I don't even want to say it aloud. Defining is not the same as describing. If you ever see a crime, you won't ask to define it. You might be able to describe the per perpetrator, but you would not be asked to define him or her. So again, don't do that by accident on a test, which is often what I see. We've now finished the four goals of psychology. Now let's consider the four W's who, what, where, and when. Who is referring to the father of psychology? Now, on the first day of class, you might be inclined to say Sigmund Freud, but we will learn that that is not, in fact, the case. It'd be this gentleman on the right, Wilhelm Wundt. And as you might also remember, he's on the you gotta spell it correctly list. And that is a little bit problematic. It will take some practice, in particular, his first name. So let's consider that with a little mnemonic that might help us out. Now remember that Wilhelm Wundt must be spelled correctly. He's one of the 10 words on our essential spelling list. And his first name, is it W-I-L-H-E-L-M or W-I-L-H-E-M? It's not a common uh, 
first name in our culture. The one of my colleagues does have that as his middle name. Let me give you a visual mnemonic. So picture him with that black coat there, but at the bottom, maybe a very long, elaborately hemmed skirt. So we'll hem. Now also picture him in an alternate image. Picture him standing at the helm of a ship, steering the way the ship of psychology will sail. Which do you think will be a better image for us? Probably him at the helm of a ship. So after you put W-I-L down, think skirt with hemline or helm of a ship, and hopefully you'll go the helm of the ship. So Wilhelm, W-I-L-H-E-L-M, and last name, W-U-N-D-T. Though I assume you can spell it quite easily by now since we had that spelling check days ago. So if you have not mastered that list, please take a moment and go back and do so. So the father of psychology, one William Wundt, in my most authentic pr pronunciation that I can master. Next, in terms of where, where do you think psychology began? Well, with a name like Wilhelm Wundt, if you want to say Germany, indeed you're correct. Would you happen to know the exact city? Once in a while I have a student who does. Uh, it's Leipzig, but Germany is fine since I assume that you haven't been there and I definitely have not been there. We'll just say Germany. Now in terms of the when, we learned on our first day of class it was some point in the 1800s. I'll give you a little way of remembering it that might help you out. Uh, it involves you being able to count, so hopefully that's not an issue. So jot down 1-8 and focus on the 8. If you're counting, what number comes before 8? Well, 7. Jot that down. And still focus on the 8. What number comes when you're counting after 8? Well, 9. So 1879. So again, you know it's hopefully in the 1800s. Focus on the 8. Remember that you have to count. Do the number before 8 when you count and the number after 8 when you count. Now let's consider the perspectives, or sometimes they're called the approaches, of psychology. This list is more or less in chronological order, but with quite a few, there's substantial overlap. So you're already ready to go to the next slide, and we'll consider the first two approaches to psychology, structuralism and functionalism. So psychology began with the approach called structuralism. I assume you can guess the first structuralist. For definition, the focus would be identifying the, we can't say the word structures because you really can't define a term with itself. So if I was going to say the structures of something, how could I alternately say the structures of something? Maybe the uh, building blocks, the elements of perhaps, so identifying the basic structures or perhaps the elements of the mental processes. Now, overlapping with this approach was our second approach, functionalism. They continued the work of the structuralists. Their focus was identifying how these mental processes, well, I know you want to put the word functioning, but again, we can't define a term with itself, so give me an alternate term for functioning. If I was going to ask you, how is your car functioning, how else could I say it? Maybe operating or working, both would be fine. So identifying how the mental processes work, uh, how they operate. Now to us, one seems to be a logical continuation of the other, but it was surprising the degree of animosity the structuralists had for the functionalists. The most famous functionalists, indeed, one of the most famous of the early psychologists, William James, once called structuralism dull and nasty, and that's an exact quote. So whereas we might seem them complimentary, the original psychologists saw them as being distinctly different. Let's now consider an approach which could be called the psychodynamic, or if you prefer, the psychoanalytic perspective. Theorist? Well, it'd be the gentleman in the bottom right. Do you recognize Sigmund Freud? I assume it's an easy to spell name since he's on our list. So I would ask my students to free associate a little bit about Sigmund Freud if I was teaching face to face and ask for what sort of images or terms come to mind. No, excuse me, but I must pause. So if you're blanking, do you know any terms related to the mind? A set of three terms, id, ego, superego. 
How about any complexes like Oedipus or Electra? Have you ever made a Freudian slip? So these would be some of the many terms associated with Freud. What about his emphasis? Well, sexuality and also aggression in terms of human nature. But if I ask you his focus, his main idea, definitely go with the unconsciousness or unconscious mind. So I left a few letters blank for you. It's an easy review to see how your spelling is going. So let's consider the Gestalt perspective. Country of origin. Well, with a word like Gestalt, if you want to guess German, uh, indeed it is a German approach. Translation. The word Gestalt can be translated in various ways, but let's say whole or pattern being particularly useful. Though I believe your text does take a slightly different tact. So whole or pattern. So the focus would be how the mental processes work together as a whole. So again, as a little recap, structuralists want to identify the basic building blocks, the basic structures of the mental processes, the functionalists, how they functioned, in other words, how they worked, and the Gestalt perspective, how these processes work together as a whole. Let's consider a very famous and very Gestalt saying. I'll start it, see if you can finish it. The whole is greater than, if you're thinking the sum of the parts, Indeed, you are correct. A very gestalt saying, the whole, W-H-O-L-E uh, sort of whole, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Let's now consider the approach known as behaviorism, though it's also called behavioral, behavioristic, or sometimes just the behavior approach. Major theorists would be the three gentlemen on the bottom. Do you recognize any of them? Or would you like to even guess? One of them is on the must spell correctly list. On the left, one Ivan Pavlov, Nobel laureate. The middle, and you'll eventually get the humor if you don't now, just trust us, it, it's just funny. Uh, John B. Watson, and the gentleman on the right, one B.F. Skinner, working with his pigeons. So theorists, Pavlov, Watson, and Skinner. Importance? Behaviorism, behaviorism is the only approach to ever dominate American psychology, and not just for a couple years, such as a presidency, or maybe not like eight years, a re-elected president, but it dominated American psychology for decade after decade after decade after decade after decade, and it was literally that many decades. And although it's not the dominant approach anymore, it's still a major approach. So the only American approach to dominate psychology. Alternate name, well, its focus is learning. So it's often called the learning approach. Emphasis, as I just noted, the role of learning and environment in our behaviors. At this point, I like to sneak in the concepts of nature and nurture, but I think I'll momentarily pause this. I'd like to turn our focus to the moment of the concepts of nature and nurture. I find a great many of my students confuse these concepts and thus don't know them. It's okay if they're giving you a little bit of difficulty now, but we need to fix that though. Nature, if it's due to nature, it's referring to genes, genetics, heredity. Put one of those into your notes. Nurture, due to learning and the environment. So let's pretend that there are two students in the hallway having a vigorous but polite discussion about the causes of alcoholism one insists it's got to be due to inheriting the genes that predispose you to alcoholism. The other disagrees, saying it's being raised in an environment by somebody who abuses and uses alcohol heavily, who learns to turn to alcohol by watching that model, who maybe is in a culture that also, any time anything goes bad on a TV show or a movie, doesn't the character turn to alcohol. So they're having the nature and nurture discussion. So the person that's arguing due to learning and environment is that nature or nurture? Well, nurture, ah, that's one refers to learning environment. Whereas again, nature due to genes and genetics. Which does behavior some emphasize? 
If you don't know, that's fine. Let me give you a John B. Watson quote. I'm going to do it from memory as well as I can, and then we'll see on the next slide how close I get. Back in 1913, he said, Give me a dozen infants, my own specified world to raise them in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone by chance and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Artist, lawyer, merchant, chief, or even beggarman and thief. And he goes on a little bit from there. So is John B. Watson saying nature or nurture? Well, he is definitely saying nurture. So what does behaviorism emphasize? Nurture, in other words, the role of learning and environment. And that quote that I just gave you was on the next slide, if you want to see it in its full exact glory. As a mnemonic to help you remember the name of the behaviors, think of the B people. So John B. Watson, pretend the B's for behaviors. I don't think he'd mind. B. F. Skinner, again, behaviors. And Ivan Pavlov, no B there, but he did care quite a bit about the behavior of his dogs. So if you remember the simple mnemonic, you won't accidentally tell me Rogers or Maslow or Freud. So remember, behaviors are the B people. I want to share this quote from you from B.F. Skinner. Consider it. A failure is not always a mistake. It may simply be the best one can do under their circumstances. The real mistake is to stop trying. So I asked my students, how many of you have gone to Hershey, Pennsylvania? And how many of you who raise their hands have gone to the factory for the tour? Well, you learn on the tour that Hershey, his business failed not once, not two times, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times, not seven times. You get the idea. But he kept trying it and reformulating it and trying to reformulate. He did not get give up and he became a tycoon and a major player in the chocolate empire. So apply that to your own life. Right now it's at the tail end of uh, the semester. Right now it's the very end of May in 2020 as I narrate this. And some of my students were doing well in the class, but during the transition they were not able to make it. So they gave up. They stopped trying. And that's sad, and sometimes trying is a good thing and not always successful, but certainly if the student didn't continue and didn't try, they wouldn't have been one of those students who succeeded, and most students did succeed. So please always give it a try, and if you're having difficulties, there are many services at college that you can reach out to, and all designed to help you succeed. Let's consider a very different perspective, either called humanistic or sometimes humanism. Theorists would be to the two gentlemen shown below. One of them is from the must spell correctly list. Any guesses? Well, the gentleman on the right is Abraham Maslow. I assume you can spell that quite comfortably by now. The gentleman on the left is Carl, with a C, uh, Carl Rogers. Two things that that particular approach emphasizes their view of human goodness. So Freud saw humans as aggressive and uh, sexual beings. The humanistic people think us more motivated primarily by our good nature, the fundamental humanity, the fundamental goodness. Also a major force would be self-actualization, which would be our tendency to want to improve, to self-better, to move in the direction of being the best human that we can possibly be. So we have our two main individuals and two of the major con concepts of this particular perspective. Let's now consider the cognitive perspective. Be careful, some students put conjugative by accident, reminds me of conjugating verbs, something we will not do in this approach. So it's a cognitive, like in a cog, shown in the bottom left. What does the word cognition mean? Well, a very good synonym is thinking. So what would the emphasis of this approach be? Thinking, the study of thinking. But we need to add more onto it than that. It was greatly influenced by the computer. Now the gentleman shown below is Alan Turing, 
he created the Enigma machine, the machine that was the very first modern day computer, the machine that cracked the Nazi code, uh, ended World War I years early, saving millions of lives. I put an attachment to the trailer of the movie called The Imitation Game. It's one of my very favorite movies. It's riveting. Uh, he's a fascinating person. I think you might really enjoy it, and who knows, you might even want to go on to uh, download the uh, Imitation Game from perhaps Netflix. So definitely associate thinking with this perspective, but in particular, what how computers think, which would be information processing, and that focus on information processing became translated into the focus of how humans engage in information processing. So when you think of the cognitive approach, think of the cog, think of Alan Turing, think of the computer, but most of all, think of human information processing. Let's now consider the perspective known as the socio-cultural perspective. The focus, well, if you look at the term, you might want to correctly infer the role of society and culture in our behavior. For example, in our culture, we don't usually have a lot of trouble saying no to something. Do you want to do something? No. Can you do something? No. In some cultures, in the business world, you do not say no. So if you're approached by somebody asking you to do something, you will say yes. And is our order going well? Yes. And you will keep saying yes and yes and yes. Because in some cultures, for example, in some Asian cultures, you do not say no. So again, the focus of how culture and society will impact our behaviors. A very fascinating area of study. So what are today's perspectives or approaches to psychology? All but the very first two. So structuralism and functionalism are no longer present, but all the other approaches we mentioned are alive and well. Let's continue our exploration of these approaches or perspectives in psychology. Let's consider developmental psychology. Later in the course, we will devote a whole chapter to it. The emphasis studies how we change across the lifespan. And that phrase lifespan is a major term in that field. The individual shown below is Jean Piaget, a very famous Swiss psychologist. And later on, we'll hear an interesting story about an attempted kidnapping attempt against him when he was a child. Let's consider another perspective within psychology, industrial, organizational. But it's such a long term that even people in the area ra rarely say it full length. They usually say I.O. I've got a new I.O. psychology textbook. I'm teaching a new I.O. psychology course. You get the idea. Its emphasis? Well, it applies psychology to the business setting. For example, how can we get workers to work more without increasing their pay? How can we increase morale without increasing their pay? How can we enhance employee retention so they don't quit and take our clients with us and, our, and their know-how and their training that we put into them? Probably, again, without paying more. So an applied area of psychology. Let's consider yet another perspective, another approach. Social psychology. We'll also have a whole chapter on social psychology at the very tail end of this course. If you're in the psychology concentration, you're required to take social psychology. The emphasis? Well, study of how people affect the something, something, and something of other people. Take a moment and see if you can guess those three blanks. They'd have to be very big concepts that would cover so much of our functioning. So try to guess. One blank should be for thinking, so if you want to be fancy and put cognition, wonderful. Feeling. And another blank, acting, though behaving is very good too. So think, act, and feel. Uh, think, behave, and feel. Make sure that you don't double dip on a test. So for example, you can't say think, feel, and moves, or you can't say think, act, and behave. So only one per blank, and you're off and running. 
Another area of psychology would be the study of sensation and perception. We'll have a very early in the chapter devoted to this topic. The emphasis will it be the study of how our bodies receive and interpret sensory stimulation. Let's now consider the mental health professionals, this area of psychology. Though not every mental health professional is a psychologist. For example, our college has a very fine program on chemical dependency and substance abuse that will help people to train for a different area within the mental health profession, uh, but they're not psychologists. We will also talk about psychiatrists later on. Again, fine professionals, but again, not psychologists. So our course will focus on the mental health professionals who are psychology trained. The mental health professionals in psychology often help people with what's called problems of living. But if a person has a mental illness, they will diagnose it and they will treat it. Let's now turn our attention to personality psychology. We'll have a full chapter devoted into this topic into the book. I think you'll find it very interesting. The emphasis, it will study our stable patterns of how we something, something, and something. Do you care the guess? If you want to say, distinctive and stable patterns of how we think, feel, and act, you'd be quite right. For our latch approach or perspective, let's consider biopsychology, though sometimes it's called physiological psychology too. The emphasis? Well, it would be the biological basis of and what does psychology always boil down to? What's our focus? If you're thinking behavior, excellent. So it's emphasis. The study of the biological basis of our behavior. Some examples. Uh, take a moment and see if you can come up with any particular areas that would be emphasized within biopsych. How did you do? The first slide is reflecting the endocrine system, in other words, the hormone system. Hormones can certainly impact our behavior. The second image, the brain. I hope the brain is intimately involved in all your behaviors. Third slide, by showing chromosomes, or perhaps you said DNA. The next picture, showing a neuron, a nerve cell. The last slide, showing the brain's natural chemicals, the neurotransmitters, Let's test your knowledge of the approaches and people associated with them. Don't look up the answers. Wait until you study and you think you achieved reasonable understanding of the material. Uh, then go and actually test yourself. You will actually need to know this for tests. You will not have time to merely look up the content. So this will be a good assessment prior to the actual test. So let's see how you did. Carl Rogers. Humanist or Humanism, Alan Turing, we associate him with the cognitive approach. Sigmund Freud will be our psycho, so psychodynamic, or if you prefer, psychoanalytic. Abraham Maslow, a humanist or humanism. John B. Watson, use our mnemonic, a behaviorist. B.F. Skinner, the same mnemonic, B.F. Skinner was a behaviorist. Jean Piaget, key developmental psychologist. Abraham Maslow, humanism or humanistic. Ivan Pavlov cared about the behavior of his dogs, a behaviorist, and Wilhelm Wundt, who got the ball started, would be our structuralist. How did you do? If you had any trouble on the previous assessment, uh, take some time and continue your study of the approaches. When you think you're reasonably successful, take this assessment. The key to doing well in most college courses is that you need to study regularly don't be the student who just studies the weekend of a test. Most of these students do not pass. Unfortunately, in both two-year and four-year institutions, about 50% of students do not succeed and earn the degree that they seek. Uh, no small reason for this is that students don't study enough time to master the material. 
as a rule of thumb for a three credit course you should be studying four to six hours per week that includes taking tests papers quizzes everything though uh, you might be on the six hour end you might be on the four hour end basically it takes as much time as it takes so take this assessment from your knowledge and it'll give you feedback in terms of your studying and if it's appropriate or if it perhaps needs tweaking number one unconscious that would be Sigmund Freud computer must be cognitive for number two three the goodness of human nature that would be humanism four well what approach is also called the learning approach ah behaviorism five the basic elements of the mental processes in other words the building blocks the basic structures so structuralism six I see the brain and if it's brain it's biopsych all day long if you thought functionalism well not bad but remember functionalism is of the mental processes not the brain itself so again for six it has to be biopsych seven lifespan is all about developmental psychology eight self-actualization a humanism concept nine uh, neurotransmitters hormones very biological ten apply psychology to the business setting well that would be IO psychology 11 building blocks ah that would be structuralism emphasize how people affect the thoughts feelings and behaviors of others ah that would be social psychology polar pattern well gestalt is the German word for polar pattern 14 stable patterns of thinking feeling and acting well that would be personality psychology human information processing definitely the cognitive approach and 16 that would be forensic psychology how did you do can psychology help me to study more effectively absolutely positively yes psychology research has given us much useful information in this particular area for example many students try to cram studying for tests only the weekend of the test not surprisingly often these students are lost and do not succeed in their college endeavor studying should be spread out every week uh, you should study each class at least two or three times a week as a rule of thumb they tell us to tell you about four to six hours per week per class should be adequate that would include your quizzes your text reading your highlighting your studying your notes uh, many students try to do it in a third of that or a quarter of that and probably will not be successful you need to take as much time as it requires for you to learn your information well we'll touch more on this in particular in the learning chapter learning must be active which means if your way of studying is just reading your notes and then rereading them and rereading them it is not going to be effective for you and you will not do well you need to test yourself as you go along so every chunk of material you need to do a little quiz on your own jot down the terms see if you can define them we'll learn more about this in the learning and memory chapter also a little stress management can go a long way we'll touch on this in particular in the stress and health chapter